also link it in chat. There we go. So please go to my Twitch. I'll wait for people to get in there. We're live right now. Alrighty, so welcome to a perspective uh, lesson for storyboard artists. Most of what I'm going to be teaching you is stuff from the uh, Steve on Gumroad that I took notes on. And uh, there's a um, storyboard art, there's a storyboard artist background designer that Steve on works with, who's a colleague of his who he has do a uh, demo, a one hour demo, as part of what you get if you're getting a um, um, storyboard uh, course from him, or a drawing course from him. It's like a bonus thing. Let's see here, I'll try to bring it up on stream actually, so I can show you where to go for this. It's on Steve On's Gumroad. Here we go. Yeah, Steve On, the former DreamWorks. So I don't know what he's doing right now, but he was working on independent film stuff. Yeah, it looks. Check this out. He's got an audit version of his storyboarding workshop and an audit version of his drawing workshop. They also have. Um, um, that's cool. It's Photoshop Bush for storyboard drawing, which is free, by the way. Uh, Weirdly, he doesn't have his sketchbook up here anymore. There was a couple. There used to be a couple other things up here, but every now and then, like uh, his Gumroad will update with. This is Gumroad is where he sells his uh, his workshops, and I had previously done the drawing workshop. I also did the action storyboarding, but uh, the audit version a while ago. I still got my notes and stuff from that. Um, but yeah, if you uh, if you take these, uh, you'll get access to the videos and stuff in them, and so on including the perspective one. Uh, and the perspective one is we're gonna be viewing the notes from, but there's better examples from a more skilled like background designer perspective expert in what we're gonna be covering today. So if you uh, if you can get a hold of these, if you consider signing up for these, this is my advertisement for Steve Ong. <laughs> Hashtag not an advertisement. But yeah, this is, uh, this is his gun right up here, Steve Ong 82. So, yeah, give, him, give his look the work and check out his short film, which, uh, Steve, um, Sherlock, Blossom Detective Holmes, this is a short film that he did. Let's we'll skip through this a little bit. I'll probably turn off the audio so I don't get a copyright strike if there's any copyright music in here. But you can see, like, he has a great sense of perspective in um, the films he's designed and stuff. I mean, of course he worked with, he was working with like background designers and collaborators on this, but like the, the, sense, of, the sense of perspective that you get in his storytelling is, um, is something that's uh, core to his storyboarding abilities and his drawing abilities in general. So you can definitely look at this stuff. But anyway, the uh, the notes that I'm taking is from a uh, background artist collaborator friend of his who uh, gave a great lecture. Great lecture. So anyway, these um, so everything that you do in storyboarding with perspective is derived from these two principles. Anything that goes farther uh, that goes farther away from you appears smaller and more compressed. Anything that is direct then anything that is directly parallel to the viewer will not appear to compress. What does that mean? Well, the best way to illustrate that is to start with eye level. So there, we got these three boxes right here. Um, this is the this is like you standing looking straight ahead. You're not looking up or down. You're looking straight ahead, and that line right there is drawing out the horizon line. So these are the point of views that you can see on the three boxes that are in front of you. If they were overlapped on each other, you'd see them in front of and behind each other. But I've had each each one individually uh, to show you that um, depending on where stuff is in the horizon line you will see things uh, you will see the tops or the bottoms of stuff 
or it will flatten out completely like that. So this thing that is directly on the this cube, the top of this cube that's directly on this horizon line, you can't see uh, that at all. It's just completely flat out. It'll be the same thing on the other side if the underside of the cube was on, right on the horizon line. Uh, the uh, the cube down here, you can see at the top of it, right here, and the same thing right here, you can see at the bottom of it, right there. So, so more on the horizon line. The horizon line, basically, like if we take this, you're staring straight ahead, extend it out, like to the ends of the to the end of the Earth, because the Earth is so huge. Uh, it appears like it the horizon appears flat even though the earth is curving so you get something like this where um, Things that are really really far away that are still above you like this some these mountains that are above you are gonna still appear above the horizon line even though they're way back in the background this plane that's up here is gonna appear above you and you're gonna see the underside of it uh, this thing that is down below you is gonna appear down below here this guy leaning against here that's below you it's going to appear there um, this kind of building sort of thing up here it goes above you so it's going to appear up there and you're not going to be able to see the top of it this cat, this cat or dog thing that's down there you can see kind of like the back of it right there and I also drew some people in here to show an example of like this these are two people right here that are the same height as you and they're standing on the horizon line looking, and this guy's looking straight at you um, but this little child over here is shorter than that person, so they are below their point of view on the horizon. And I also wanted to show this person is also the same height as you. Uh, they're standing to the left, but they're still on the horizon line at the same height. This is the bottom of their feet um, uh, are, would be placed about here and they are just as tall as this person so we got a line right here to measure that but yeah um, the eye line and the horizon line is uh, what you use to determine uh, whether stuff is above or below you basically Oops. so I did some kind of crummy drawings here I might draw over them again this is an example of one. Well, we'll go over these again. There'll be we'll be doing some demonstrations, and I actually want you to follow along and take notes when we do them uh, of of the different one point, two point, three point, and so on. Uh, but yeah, um, yeah. Oh yeah, if there's some people who are mentioning in Twitch chat that they've taken his classes. Yeah, I, this is a good. For those of you who've taken his classes, if you haven't looked at the perspective uh, class yet, this is basically what I'm doing. This is basically notes from that. So if you have access to that video, uh, basically uh, I would suggest rewatching it after this, because all I'm doing this is basically what I'm. This is study time for all of us to engage with these ideas and try them out ourselves. Uh, we'll be having some study and practice time after this to mess with these and we might even go beyond what was in the notes to kind of maybe look at some examples from existing films or existing uh, animation it might be a good idea to look at the Steve Ahn um, uh, De Detective Blossom uh, video to uh, see how he used perspective for his storytelling so I got the one point perspective here and this is a two so Functionally in storyboarding, uh, one point perspective is often used to create a focal point, uh, a single point of interest. Uh, one point perspective, for those who don't know, is you get, you have a horizon line, and then you decide where the focal point is, kind of like that. Uh, draw a line through that like so and then all your um, perspective lines extend out from that single point like so Oop. or I can go into it like this uh, I would suggest using kind of you can uh, like if you kind of get used to um, 
using tools to draw in perspective. Um, you can use like assisted tools. There's a perspective ruler actually like in Clip Studio EX. And there's been like the star thing that uh, Ethan Becker shows off, but it's good to learn these rules so you can use them with any, with any tools. So you know what you're short cutting at. So we'll actually get to do some perspective drills and perspective studies today. Um, but here's a kind of crummy quick example of a one point perspective grid. Um, and now I'm going to use the, maybe yeah, I'll use some black. And to unless, so I'm kind of finding that it's a good idea to when you're trying to work out stuff cleanly in perspective probably don't, not going to want to use a sketchy pen like I just did here where it has the varying thickness and kind of tooth to it you're probably going to want to use something that's kind of like a micron pen like this that has like no real significant thickness to it or mechanical pencil kind of so then you just work out the lines but you can add fancy Thick to thin lines and stuff later. So anyway, here here's a cube that is left of a, that is to the left of us on the perspective line here. So maybe I'll just use these the line tool again because that makes it a little easier. So it's going to follow the lines the lines of perspective here. There we go, that's a cube. Now I'm going to put another cube that is closer to us slightly, right about here. But it's going to be, oops, maybe like this. It's going to maybe be a lot lower so we can see over it. Like so. And then I'm going to make one that's high up here, like that. So this one is like really close to the center of the horizon line, so that line is going to be flattened out. Like we're not going to see the side of the cube, you see. It works the same way that the horizon line does when you can't see the underside or the top of an object if it's really close to that the same principle. That just goes straight up like that. Got another cube like floating in space up here. So there's a little demonstration of a variety of cubes. Well, that might be the start of a composition of some sort. Um, so what I was trying to show off here was a kind of a crummy version of an example that the uh, artist gave in that um, in the Gumroad video I was talking about. Of uh, he wanted to um, show two examples of like an indoor and an outdoor scene using uh, using one point perspective of like this kind of archway and there's like stuff behind here and stuff. Here's the archway itself with this kind of interior sort of thing, and then he like put buildings above right there. But it's all one point perspective and it's all going back to the center this vanishing point here for how he, for how he uh, built the scenery and everything. I'm just kind of doing this quick and dirty. So if you notice like um, the measuring lines for stuff that isn't falling to the vanishing point on here is generally like kind of pa parallel 90 degree stuff like this. I can hear myself one second here. I think I'm going to have to turn on push to talk in this room. Give me a second. All right, let me test something real quick. All right, thank you. All right, so, um, so yeah, he showed an exterior kind of uh, scene here. So like, what I was talking about is like uh, this little sidewalk kind of here. 
is going to be going like completely horizontal and like the buildings that go up here are going to be like completely vertical like that obviously like if you're going to like do like a tree or something you might have like you might want to kind of map it a bit to get like where to know where the shadow is going to appear or whatever or like how it's going to round over the form or whatever with your ellipses or whatnot I should really, I don't think I covered ellipses in this. I might actually have to review ellipses in perspective at some point. I don't think that's actually covered in his demonstrations. But that might be worth worth touching on a little bit later. Uh, but anyway, he he like gave an example of an outdoor scene with a kind of an outdoor focal point here, and then like kind of a deep space hallway scene with like these kind of pillars going on in a repeating hallway for an interior that just goes further and further back. And in the demonstration, he actually, like, like faded out this part because it's further back in space. And that is a principle known as atmospheric perspective, where things that are further away from you uh, will tend to kind of appear like lighter or not as dark because they are being covered up by the at by the atmosphere of the water vapor uh, in the air, and interestingly enough, uh, when you're in space or in an absolute vacuum, there is no atmosphere perspective because there's no atmosphere. So if you're on the moon, you're not going to see any atmospheric perspective. So that's something to keep in mind if you're trying to get some realism in your space-themed compositions or space theme storytelling. That's if you're going for um, scientific authenticity or realism with those. If you're not, if you're doing like a space opera or something, then you can do whatever and set whatever rules of maybe there's air in space or maybe it just looks cool. So, yeah. But viewers are a little bit more sophisticated these days. So I think even like in Star Wars, they don't use atmospheric perspective when stuff appears in space. Let's maybe put a door here. Yeah, the center of focus is this area back here. Center focus is this area here. So you can color code that. So that area. That area. So that's one point perspective. We're going to throw this in the one point folder here. I organized my folders. How about that? So here's two point perspective. Um, give me one second here. I got to open something. So, uh, two-point perspective, um, two-point perspective uh, is uh, has more depth than one-point perspective, and it can handle pretty much ev pretty much every layout situation. Like the most common, uh, the probably the most common, most used uh, layout you'll be using is two-point perspective. And in this case, it kind of like the it basically works like one point, except there's two points to plot from, which means you can plot like both sides of a cube going backwards towards vanishing points, for example. So let's maybe put another cube behind this cube, following the same vanishing point. The other thing is like when you're doing this stuff, like I hope you guys are maybe trying to follow along and maybe try some of this yourself with some drawing materials you have. Uh, I'll show you how actually how to plot these. That's pretty pretty easy. Uh, but some tips when you're plotting your perspective grids. 
Uh, don't do what I do here, where I made both the vanishing point and the perspective lines on the, gri on the grid um, the same color. You want to do something like this, where they are different colors and you can differentiate them, and then the color you use to draw on top of it should be a different color. So you know what you're looking at. You can even, f you can even reduce the, the opacity, and make the grid transparent, so you can concentrate on what you're working on. Let's maybe make this cube shorter here. This one is actually taller, see? So, but I me mismeasured it, so maybe I should fix that. Let's do that. I'm using a hard eraser here so I can get rid of these easier. Let's fix this. So these are like not really quite identical. I think this one's thinner than the other one, but they're about the same height and width. But this side is shorter than that one. A little bit, kind of. Um, see, I mean, you can play with it. Um, we'll go, um, we might go more, we might go further into perspective in a future week on how to like kind of use simplified characters in perspective um, to kind of plan out where characters are posing and standing and stuff but, but a good way to start is to start with like a cube kind of like what I'm doing here and then you can do like a gesture drawing using the uh, cube as the guideline kind of like this And uh, that's an exercise you can actually do in your figure drawing class. When you get a pose for the model, try to re uh, try to repose it using a perspective using a perspective grid and a cube. Like draw a cube in perspective, and then try to fit the model inside of it, modifying the angles of the model's body parts in the cube. Somebody asked if uh, when you use the Tomb Boom, do you use the perspective tool? I heard that the tool can lock the lines to make it more accurate. I have not, but I plan to in the future. Um, there is also a perspective ruler in Clip Studio Paint. And there's some perspective related tools in, in Photoshop. Um, the perspective ruler it seems pretty handy in Clip Studio Paint, but I'm not going to mess with that. Uh, until I kind of get a better handle on this stuff, and then I might go through some tutorials on it. Um, by the way, two-point perspective is uh, great for like really dynamic shots, and also it's a little bit more disorient. It can well, it's great. It's great for really dynamic shots. It's actually great for most shots, really. Um, but you can like um, like. If you notice, like, you notice what's happening here with the, um, with the backdrop there. Like, the horizon line is above the, vi the visual plane of the, ca the camera field, which means that wh what the camera or whoever is looking at the scene, whoops, get rid of this. So, both of these scenes right here this is uh, from the point of view of someone who's standing above what's happening in front of them that like they, they might be standing on a pedestal or something above these characters and they're looking down uh, the, this one down here this is from the point of view of a character or a camera that's looking upwards and the horizon line is kind of here one sec the horizon line is like just off their field of view same same deal here the horizon line is just off their field of view here but 
one point, one two, but it's gonna be two point perspective. Doesn't mean, of course, that you can't have the, that you can't have the camera in the field of view. Um, in fact, you'll see that uh, quite a bit. Like it, like two point can handle almost just about any kind of layout problem. Like I said in the notes, but here I'll make another quick. I'm gonna do like a really quick example. It's a small one. Let's do a straight line, black for the horizon line right in the middle. Let's get it pretty wide apart so I can have more options to plot my points. Uh, plot a red point on the right. I'll plot a blue. No, I want to plot a yellow one because it's different than my different than my field guide. That's what they call this, by the way. I think that's a field guide. Um. But yeah, so for this, I'm just going to go through and get like a bunch of perspective lines in going to my vanishing point. So if you want to make like a if you want to make a perspective grid that's pretty accurate, like that actually has lines that are like the correct even length apart to each other. Uh, there's some measuring tricks for that that I'll get into later, but I'm kind of like freehanding this. But as a rule of thumb, like as the perspective lines get closer to the horizon, kind of like this right here, they should be they should get start getting closer together. So like these lines down here are going to get really really close together like that, and these ones up here are going to be getting really wide wider wider apart or they should but if I drawn that better so I'll, let's do a simpler one down here that kind of illustrates this so these are just going to get closer and closer together as they move further along the page get closer to the horizon line but of course I, I kind of went a little premature with this so let's maybe just try this So my second point of perspective, I'll just plot in red so I can differentiate these, whoops. But you can actually use Ethan's star thing actually to get a more accurate perspective grid. That was one of the tricks that you can use. But there is a way to plot it. I don't know if I'll get into that right now though. Yeah. going to get into that. that. That's when you need three-point perspective. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Then I yeah. So, I mean, it's, um, so now you can get, like, stuff that is visible above and below the horizon here. Like, uh, let's get, like, kind of this cube here where we can see the top of it. And then get another cube in here. Where you can see the underside of it. But yeah, um, just as an example of like this kind of underside grid stuff.
want to get at least one cube in there. All right, so let me stuff that all in the two-point folder. So here's um, a couple camera tilts. This is literally addressing the, what you were talking about. So here's a two-point perspective camera tilt. Uh, this this camera tilt actually has set up the Z. The um, if you notice, this is this is essentially a one-point perspective grid where we have added another vanishing point way up top here to create the impression that we're looking upwards. So that means like, let's say we're looking up at a skyscraper right here. It's going to look something like this. Let's pretend the horizon, let's pretend the skyscraper is ending at the horizon line. Actually, it should go down a little below because we're standing on ground here. So that means it's going to go like that. That goes to the vanishing point, and then Let's maybe throw a person in there for scale. The person is also going to be following the perspective grid. somebody way back there. Uh, anyway, that also means, like, say if you wanted to draw draw a person here, um, what's going on with their head would be influenced by this grid so that we can see the underside of their jaw here. The rib cage is kind of tilted up towards us, or not that extreme because it has to follow this here. This person is standing above us, by the way, we're looking up at them. This person is taller than us somehow. And I guess this part of them would be below the horizon line, so the top of the cube of the hips, something like that. So that's a two-point camera tilt. So what happens in three-point? Well, three-point is literally you start with two vanishing points the same way with two-point. Then you add another third point. Uh, another thing you do is you can make it four point and add another one like up here. Uh, generally, it was going to be basically like a like it's essentially doubling up on these. So this one is going to be out here somewhere, and the vanishing point should probably be equidistant. Here. Oh, there's going to be some weird warping going on. But this becomes useful for, like, those weird shots that you've seen in films where, like, uh, 
um, a character falls past the camera from like a really high up point, like a big old building that's bulging in here and then going down like this, down to the ground way down here. Something like that. And there are additional rules for how to warp this properly, but we won't get into that. I just kind of wanted to touch on this. I like how four point can be used for that sort of thing. But anyway, getting back to three point. Um, this uh, three point's advantages are that it adds an additional level of depth to things. And it's... Um, it's essentially uh, it's essentially the same as the two point camera tilt, but like at an irregular angle where you're like looking from side to side at these things that would normally be kind of straight on like this. So like the way that this would get turned into three point. Um, The way that this thing would get turned into three point is if you uh, is if you turned your head to the side, basically. Because it could be like you turn your head over to the side here. You're gonna need another vanishing point over this way. But you're also going to need to um, change the orientation of this vanishing point because the stuff out the stuff outside the picture plane is going to start getting increasingly warped. And when you turn your head to look at things, stuff doesn't stay warped; it reorients itself to your point of view. So while you might have Two point while well, you might have two point perspective on either side when you turn your head over here this point is going to come over here with you so then that thing will look a little bit more like like that Someone asked, can breaking the grid line be a good thing, like for stylistic things? It can be, and there's a lot of people that do break it, but um, they are people who understand the rules of perspective enough to enough to know when to break them. So yeah, you can, uh, but you want to really understand the rules, and uh, not just un not just understand them, but you want to practice them from observation and from perspective rules and stuff. You know Kim Jong Gi. The um, Kim Jong Gi, the uh, amazing artist who does like tons of, who's like famous for doing all those art, all that lovely stuff with perspective out of his head. He's done he, the way he got that way is he like did tons of observation drawing from the real world, and he didn't study linear perspective until later. He was just like trying to fit how everything looked from his point of view onto the page, and also trying to break it down three dimensionally to show it from different angles. Um, he didn't really study the he didn't really study the rules of perspective until much later in his life. It did improve his work when he did do it, but he um he understood enough from looking at existing art that like stuff stuff tends to go towards particular vanishing points depending on where you're looking at it from. Uh in order to kind of use that. And he sort of like he didn't study it, the theory, but he like kind of understood the basic idea enough from like hearing it talked about or kind of seeing it in other in existing art to kind of use it. But the point is, is that the best way to learn how to utilize perspective is to try to use it from observation uh, and exercise it from observation in the real world, so it'll engage your spatial awareness. 
and your um, ability to to see how stuff that is really complex uh, changes how it looks in the real world right in front of your eyes uh, depending on where it's positioned and then you can develop a sense of being able to spin it around in your head from different angles and draw it from different angles using the same rules which is what Kim Jong Gi does so anyway that's a three-point camera tilt right there this camera is looking down but you could also have a camera tilt that's looking up or just anywhere really three-point camera tilt adds extra depth of versatility versatility to your composition construction and of course, if you want to do crazy camera moves like this, or like even that kind of bulging warp in the middle for something, you can mess with like a four-point grid. So, this is about field of view. So this is these aren't the best examples because these cubes are not accurate to each other. Like if I really wanted to show a good example of this, I'd try to measure the same cube to show what happens to the cube, to this same cube depending on um, like depending on what your field of view is but uh, I will try to try to walk through this with the same idea of what's going on um, so the field of view or field of view or angle of view um, is basically like the the width um, by which you are viewing things on the picture plane. So literally like um, the field of view changes depending on how wide the picture plane is. That means that um, or that means that for example here I'll just color code this so it's easier to see. Our field of view would change to a narrow field of view if if this became the picture plane right here. Um, or it would change to an even wider field of view than this if it changed to this. Although that would create a lot of weird warping with around the edges of the of the vanishing points that I made here. Um, here's an example of a wide field of view. Uh, wide field views are dynamic. They're also disorienting and stuff. Dynamic field of views ha uh, have more visual information. They tend to warp things. Like you can see how warped those kind of um, that grid is getting way up there. Uh, the one of the examples that uh, they gave in the video was in one of the in a Legend of Korra. Um, at one point, Korra gets mercury poisoning towards the end of the series, and uh, everything gets disoriented. So they used a wide they used wide angle shots to show how disorienting stuff was for her. Uh, wide angle views also means there's more visual information. That means there's a lot more stuff being recorded in the environment with the wide angle lens than um, versus a narrower one. So here's when you here's a more narrow lens. Um, another thing to point out is that in order to create wide and narrow angle lenses, you are sent you are doing two things. You are uh, picking what your field of view is. And you are also, and you are also uh, moving the, moving the, uh, you're essentially moving where the vanishing points are in relation to the picture plane. Um, so you can sit, you can wrap your head around it from both ways. Like you can, uh, you can take some, you can take a grid like this and then like create a picture plane in it to create a narrow field of view shot like that. Or you can just pull apart or 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 push together your vanishing points uh, without changing the field of view to create the same effect, basically. Um, and I kind of drew this. I drew this down here to kind of illustrate this. Like about here is our vanishing points, right here, same color code right there. But this is what this is what you this is kind of what you see when the field of view narrows. When you narrow the field of view, it feel objects feel closer to you. There's less visual information because like stuff is being taken out of the frame here on the sides. There's less warping that go on. It tends to be like calmer compositions, flat and stuff. Narrow 
narrow-ish field of view is the most common kind of narrow kind of like medium field of view or whatever is the kind of most common composition you'll usually see in a film again like film animation or whatever and then there's this other prints there's this other thing that's like a super narrow um, field of view called telephoto and telephoto is uh, when you like really really narrow down the field of view it creates the um, it creates the feeling that you're looking at something from very far away through binoculars. In this case, this guy would probably be looking at a very, very tiny cube, very, very tiny cube that looks like a miniature set. They actually use like kind of telephoto lens effects on miniatures to make them look larger, um, in kind of uh, in larger or smaller, depending on narrowing or widening the field of view, kind of that way. So like this could be like the point of view of like a somebody from a sniper perch or looking at binoculars at a building from very far away. And uh, what happens with telephoto is the field of view narrows so much that the um, the vanishing points kind of start to um, converge to the point that they become almost flat. like. There's like this vanishing point over here that's still close enough to us that there's enough visual information on the side of this here to see it properly. But this vanishing point to the left has moved so far off to the left that like these lines are like almost parallel. There's lines that are like all, just about basically parallel. So, uh, that is field of view. So now that we've done gone through this stuff, this is all the basics. Uh, we're going to go through some other things in a bit. And then we'll also do some live demos and uh, exercises together, doing some perspective drills. Uh, I want to go through quick, quick through some tips that might help you, whatever art program you're using. Uh, I went through some of them earlier, but I want to go through them specifically right now. Uh, one of them is uh, make different layers for your grid, and maybe make a folder form. Like here, here's my horizon line right here. Now I'm going to make a new layer. My her and uh, I'm going to use a different color. And I'm plotting my vanishing points right there. Maybe I'll make another layer right here. And I'll plot my van I'll plot my other vanishing point over here in a different color. I'm gonna make another layer. And I'm going to use the line tool to uh, create some perspective lines. Or you can use Ethan's star thing on that. That also creates a similar effect and you'll get a more kind of a patterned grid going on. I got that. And uh, I'll make a new layer. I'll use this line tool to make even more of these. You can do this with a ruler. You can also try it freehand just to understand it, but probably gonna want to do a, use a ruler if you're drawing in, if you're drawing this in real life. Preferably with a very thin um, pencil or marker, like mechanical pencil or micron pen or something. I'm not going to really complete this or make this perfect, but I just want to show like the basic idea of how to organize your grid. And then like, um, let's say now I, now that I've got this kind of grid going here, um, I'm going to maybe use, like use purple for my field guide. And you can choose a color coding system of your own for these. So now like I'm going to, I'd probably like if I know what my aspect ratio is for this like my camera like let's pretend this is like 16 this is accurate 16 by 9 right here for like HD TV or whatever um, 
Now I've got a little field guide that I can resize while keeping the same ratio and stuff to find the angle of my shot. That also means like if I'm animating the camera move I can use something like this. Just use maybe a different color here. Yellow. That might work. I'm just going to use yellow for the kind of curve that the camera is taking here. And then uh, on top of that, let's see here. Oops. What is that? On top of that, I'm going to put a little square right here. And maybe I'm going to change the color of that. Using the luminosity slider to make it black so it's more visible. Like that's like that's like the final frame where my shot ends up. So I'll use green so I can more easily see what's going on here. So what we got here is a planned camera move uh, using this field guide. So it starts up here. Let's maybe draw something here so we can really kind of see this. So. We're following this path of this cube in the frame right here for our layout composition or whatever. So the cube stacks up right here by this panel, and this our cube has like flown over here. And then our cube comes to rest, like kind of here ish. Maybe I'll use the green again just to differentiate. I'm just showing the path that this cube is taking through space. I might, I might draw some more drawings here showing what it looks like at different points in the, in the storyboard. This is the path that the cube is going to take. It's going to curve like this through space kind of towards us and curve like that. And then I can use, and then at each of, every time I need to move it along here kind of this loose guideline right here. I'll be able, I'll know where in perspective I need to measure it. Yeah, uh, somebody is asking about how to rewatch these. Later, they're going to be up on YouTube. Uh, you can uh, in Discord. You can click Space Dad's user profile and find my YouTube page. Now that I'm getting better about like keeping copyrighted music uh, out of these videos, uh, it's a lot easier to upload them. There, yeah. This is our. This is our little camera move with a cube that's flying through space and ending up here where they, once it comes to rest, the camera zooms in on the cube here, and this would be like our final shot. Let's actually take a look at how it looks like. Our first, this is our first shot. Zoom in a little bit. 
this is our second shot. Kind of following along here, curving around and continually shrinking. So it winds up on this shot and then it finally zooms in here. Yeah. Okay, so I was still for a bit, sorry, so this will be like hitting the same background but rotating the camera through it, right? Or with one object? What's that? So, what's virtual here is like uh, everything will be on the same background, like in the same yeah yeah this is just an example of how you can use this for for figuring out how stuff is moving on a camera move and uh showing how you can use the field the field guide to kind of plot out a camera move on a perspective grid And and you can and you can use this for any anything any kind of perspective, any kind of uh, shot. You move. You can figure out where your camera is going to be on the perspective grid for this particular camera angle, the camera move, and stuff. Uh, and uh, that's the other thing, though. Like these perspective points are generally going to be in the same spot. When do you think that those perspective are going to be in the same spot as the field guide moves around the picture plane. When do you think those 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 when do you think the these are going to animate? Well, those are going to animate if the ca if the position of the camera itself is moving, not just tilting and turning. So that means we're uh, in future stuff we're going to get more into uh and this is actually kind of the direction where the animation classes are going to be heading in the future. Uh, we're going to be getting more into principles of animating your animating your vanishing points around the scenes. Like, here's a star thing here. Here's a star thing here. Now the thing is, with computer-assisted tools of like 3D and things like that, you don't need to animate all this, but there's a lot of people that do like freehand kind of animated perspective. The people who do that are the Sakuga WebGen people. Uh, so let's see. Um, there is a Twitter account I found yesterday, which has a lot of good stuff on it. I'm going to go to it real quick and bring it on stream. Oh, here we go. This is fantastic. Um, this has a lot of perspective in it. I don't know if it has moving backgrounds, though. But this would be a good thing to break down. This would be a good thing to break down and study for sure. For the different uses of type styles of perspective. I see one point. I see two point. I see three point. Look at that camera move there. But the backgrounds are not moving in this, and that's what I'm looking for is when the backgrounds themselves are moving. Oh, here we go. Put one point perspective. So all this artist, all, literally all this animator did was just like one one point perspective grid. Uh, there's a little bit of perspective there when she turned around the corner there, though, even though there's just like one line there. This artist has enough of an intuitive understanding of perspective that they can kind of like rough out something like this and then freehand it. Um, maybe go down through this and see if there's other examples. Oh, look, there's perspective in the backdrop there in the layout right there. You can see that. So, on this, that is a 
whoops. So those are perspective lines right there, going to a vanishing point down there. Those are perspective lines there, going to a vanishing point up over there. Those are perspective lines over there, going to a vanishing point over there. And this is a ref. This is like a reference point for <coughs> these crisscross is like a reference point for the center point of the camera right here. But yeah, this camera is like someone at close to eye level or so looking down at this character's feet. So let's see if I can find a good example. Oh, here we go. This is a good example right here. This is a kind of a uh, a live demo and about that was done in about two hours by a Studio Trigger guy, I believe. Yeah, Studio Trigger. Um, and this shows off somebody who has a intuitive understanding of perspective from tons of practice. They're able to animate lots of stuff that uh, this is very rough, loose stuff here that um, plays with perspective and actually animating um, animating the perspective grid itself. And they don't need to necessarily draw it when they're doing this stuff like this. They don't necessarily need to draw out the whole perspective grid because they understand the rules. Uh, you see them, f you see them kind of like, those are, those are like shots and stuff and like little speed lines and other things, all kind of following the rules of perspective there. The camera's turning over to the side here and we're seeing the vanishing points change. What's cool is that he is actually kind of using like the characters as a guide point for the vanishing point. The vanishing point would be somewhere that way in that shot. But then the vanishing point is like over here behind him here. Uh, you can actually see on this shot here, this is a, you can see that the perspective lines right there for a vanishing point that's somewhere over here, and the perspective lines here for a vanishing point that's somewhere over here. Um, you can kind of sort of sense that he maybe has like a sense of the three point going on here. Just a little bit. So that is a two-point perspective shot, although I think arguably you could say this is three-point, because those kind of feel like they're going to a third perspective vanishing point up the top here. But I mean, this is like advanced application of what I'm talking about. Like if you memorize these rules and use them constantly and practice them constantly, you'll be able to start playing with them like these animators do. That's what I'm working towards in the um, in the animation class. I want to work towards a web gen approach to animation, but using the building blocks of the fundamentals, all the stuff we're, we're going through here. Uh, another thing that this guy's using is, you know, it's like he's using a lot of like simple shapes that kind of describe three D forms, like this thing that it's kind of brick that this character, sh this brick like object that this character is shooting at his gun. Uh, and this is very, very simple um, kind of cubic shapes. Like a cleanup artist might go back through and make this more detailed non model to whatever the weapon is that he's using there. But using like these simple cubic shapes to convey to an audience the illusion of perspective is a uh, excellent trick. And that is where you get stuff like the Udipon cube, the infamous Udipon cubes. Let's see if I can find a good example of that. Cubes. So Udipon cubes are like the are these things. You might have seen like a lot of debris in anime. It tends to look like very cubic, kind of like that, because it's easier to track cubes in perspective than it is like a bunch of random stuff random shapes and it looks cool it looks very stylized and stuff but it uses perspective basically let's see if we can find a good gif of this stuff in motion but th like thinking of your 
of the things you're animating in terms of simple shapes that you can track more easily will really help you um, concentrate your energy. Let's see here. Might be a good sized GIF in here somewhere. I think One Punch Man. One Punch, One Punch Man has some good examples. Um, but we want to, we want an animated example here somewhere if we could find one. No, that's not that's not a good example. Those are random jaggies. That is not a good example. Oh, here we go. Yeah, there's some of it going on here in the ground here. But, I mean, uh, that's something to look f looked for. If you see that One Punch Man episode that I should... That clip from, there's some, some excellent examples of Yudapon cubes happening in that scene. But yeah, that is a perspective tool shorthand trick. Um, but yeah, like, literally he's animating the perspective with each shot, like character would be like like that then in the next frame he might be like or in a later frame he'd be like towards the enemy here I'm going to get some more kind of like motion lines that are going back in perspective to reinforce and and telegraph to the audience where that's the very that's the important thing about animating perspective you need to f figure out like telegraphed cues of where the perspective is for the audience you don't need a lot like so maybe some motion lines here and there on some frames But we will get time to play with these with play with these more in the future. I want people to kind of digest the basic principles, but it's good to see where this stuff is going for how you'll be able to play with this stuff. We'll be able to do calmer stuff for like storyboards. Like static sh like not every shot in an anime obviously is gonna be like a crazy moving camera shot like some of these. or an animated production, whether it be anime or western or whatever. But knowing how this works um, also can let you plot out camera moves that are going to be happening in like 3D film, in 3D films, and 3D feature film productions and stuff too. Uh, the Overwatch uh, Overwatch uh, animatic we saw last week for the first Overwatch CG trailer. Uh, Overwatch animatic. Let me see if I can bring it up. Because there's a good example of applying this stuff for a, for a storyboard animatic. Damn it, there's a bunch of fan made stuff. I'm trying to find the official Overwatch animatic things. Give me a second, folks. But take a look at these little thumbnail things for ideas of how to play with animating perspective if you want to. While I, look, while I try to find this Overwatch animatic. I'm trying to find it on Twitter. Just a bunch of fan art garbage, damn it. But yeah, if you are able to find the Overwatch um, animat the, uh, the, tr the o animatic for the first Overwatch trailer, there are camera move, camera moves and perspective on there with like kind of freehand rough loose animated perspective. Uh, 
I think I might have found something, not... Yeah... Nope, uh, that was the full film. Anyway, just take my word for it and hopefully try to find it, because I found it last week. But anyway, I think we should look at maybe some of Steve Ahn's short film stuff real quick. Uh, does anyone have any questions, or does any is anyone struggling with any of any ideas in this? Oops. Excuse me. Just hide my shame, real quick, of my obsession and uh, hobby with PC building. Uh, now would be a good time to plug, uh, if you got Twitch Prime, you can sub me on blah blah blah, herp de deer de deer. Um, well, yeah, if you got a pair of Prime sub and you like what I'm doing, if you find what I'm doing helpful, uh, you can toss that my way and it'll give me a few bucks in about 15 days. Uh, or you can donate directly via my coffee link, uh, down below. I'm just kind of loosening up with the pen, pen tool real quick before I get into this next thing. And, and I also have a direct PayPal link for, uh, for donations. So, uh, what we're going to do next is we're going to look at some of, like, Steve Ahn's stuff and maybe try to find, try to, like, analyze it a bit to see how uh, he uses perspective for storytelling. And, and, uh, and also, um, try to identify what kinds of perspective he's using in the shots that he has in his short film. So, uh, someone had a question real quick? Someone was trying to speak up, sorry. Freehand perspective is an easy way to do that. Uh, first, you first you do some you do uh, some basic perspective dr drills to kind of understand it a bit. Then you just play with it. Like you can do this. Like you kind of know how to make like sort of like lines that are kind of like wider from each other, going sort of to a vanishing point off here that you can kind of sense and stuff. Like this doesn't have to be perfect. And then you can kind of just like play with it and stuff see what breaks and what doesn't. It's just like a quick way of sketching perspective. Um, you can also draw from observation in the real world. Look at stuff around you and see how stuff warps. Um, or try to draw things on a rough loose perspective grid that you have. Um, I'm trying to actually strategize about ways to make practicing this more fun and more intuitive myself. Um, some things that I've been looking at include a lot of the acolytes of Kim Jong-gi and uh, Jong -gi sketchbook. There's a book I have here. Let me see if I can find it. That I got at um, Anime Expo. I did not Anime Expo. Uh, CTNX. Uh, let me see if I can find it real quick. I had it with me the other day. It's somewhere here. But it's a book uh, that's like a bunch of sketchbook drawings by a bunch of Kim Jong-gi's uh, uh, contemporaries and acolytes, mostly like students from who are at the school that he teaches at. And they do a lot of like perspective drawing from observation in their sketchbook of scenes around them where they uh, draw people around them, they insert characters in them, they, uh, they play with it, and they just have fun with perspective uh, and observation from the real world. I would have to dig that out later. I might share that again. I had that with me the other day. It's somewhere in this room, and I don't know where. But it's a great book, and I'll try to find it if I can so I can share it. But Kim Jong-gi has some sketchbook stuff to look at. Um, 
So let's see, Cambridge on Guy, Sketchbook Cafe. There's a lot of non-WorkSafe stuff here, so I'm gonna have to be really selective about this. But, um, you'll see a lot of stuff like this. Yeah, I think, I think there's gonna be some pretty okay stuff to show on stream here. But yeah. You'll see a lot of stuff like this. You might even see stuff with, like, characters inserted into the background or, um, like, when they're out, when they're out having meal, when he's out having meals, he'll draw stuff like that. Um, he'll just pl he'll play with it, and uh, and just like just tr just pl he'll play with it, and mess with it. Like I think this one, they were stuck in traffic, so he just busted out his sketchbook, so he wouldn't get, oh, uh, during a time when he wouldn't get car sick, and did this. So it uh, looks like they were at the hospital or something, and he was doing this. Uh, you can play with it in the real world, and uh, obviously because of COVID being what it is, uh, you're not going to be able to go out very much right now, but um, CalArt sketchbooks. Uh, This, the the CalArts sketchbooks that they submit, that students submit, potential students submit to be accepted at CalArts include examples in them of the field sketching from their own house, actually, like that. Like do stuff like this, and like you include their their hands down here. This isn't even as like detailed as like Kim Jong Gi, and this is someone who got accepted to CalArts. Like this isn't per perfect perspective. Like look at this. This is all kind of this is these are these are imperfect. Those are imperfect. But like playing with it to kind of like get it rough and loose together and stuff. Um, and they used both sides of the paper, flipping the flipping the sketchbook horizontally. This is fun. You just have fun with it. Hear that? Uh, it's, they slip they flip it sideways, and you can see kind of a topsy turvy effect of this sort of one point perspective thing going on here. This is a one point perspective drawing. Let me find some other examples in here. Uh, this one is actually, I would call this more orthographic-ish, but there is some perspective actually. Yeah, no, this is kind of one point-ish. This is almost kind of telephoto lens, I would say. Like uh, showing off, like your vanish, your closest vanishing point is over this way, or furthest vanishing point is on the right. This is kind of like a far further telephoto view away from this building. There's some perspective here. Look at that. Two point perspective right here on the staircase. And I mean, this is somebody, this is a heavily manicured sketch. Oh, that's, look at that. Vanishing point, vanishing point. This is a big ass two point perspective drawing and arguably you could even put another perspective point right here I think this is technically like two point but with three points right here on the horizon line like you can plot a perspective point here to like get stuff there one point right there I guess you could also call those that one point. That might be a two. That might be like a two point, right there, looking down. I think. This is a heavily manicured sketchbook, by the way. So don't be intimidated by this. Um, so somebody was trying to get accepted to one of the hardest to get accepted schools in the, in the art world. So this is a heavily manicured sketchbook that they probably had a tutor um, help them help them construct and pick what to put on each page and so on. But even then, you can see them making mistakes and trying and like um, and playing loose with stuff. Let's, get, let's find some more examples of perspective. This observation drawing with a little bit of perspective in it. There's some perspective right there. POV perspective with their feet. More POV perspective. Like this is st stuff they did around Christmas time. Yeah. 
So yeah, I mean, like, you can just play with perspective. Like, if you want to, you can just, like, draw tons of, like, cubes for a while. Uh, someone in Discord wanted me to ask if you could explain fisheye lenses in that kind of perspective. <laughs> yeah, uh, I need to study those, actually. But, uh, essentially, fisheye lenses are a wide-angle lens on, um, like... I forget what the exact number is. What is, I think... It's like five point perspective, five, 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 it's like six point perspective, fish eye. Yeah, five point fish eye is five point perspective. Um, I think we should actually save that for another time because it's uh, uh, to go in depth on versus this because I'm not as prepared to go over that or practiced in it for that matter. But let's try something like uh. Here, let's see here. But essentially, five point perspective is this. So you've got one point there, 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 and you and it's called fisheye because you can kind of bulgy fisheye curves. There's curves that happen that warp the um, the image. Fisheye is essentially your, it's an ultra 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 wide angle lens uh, where things start to bulge and warp. Uh, let me see here. So let's see here. There is a book from the guy who made the perspective for comic, David Chelsea. David Chelsea made a book. Yeah. Yeah, it DM meant to me, but uh, David Chelsea made a comic book uh, about uh, pers perspective for comic book artists. Uh, he's got a couple other books that are out on it, including Extreme Perspective for Artists. That does uh, that goes like goes more into like like grids and gives he uses shows some grid templates and how to use them and much more like warpy fish fisheye stuff. Um, I think perspective in action is like basically an activity book. And one of the activities in there uh, involves painting. In, here, let's see. Let's see. Perspective in, perspective in action by David Chelsea. There is some. There are some. There's an exercise that I saw in it. Oh, here it is. This is from the book. And there's some examples down here of not people necessarily following what he did, but. Uh, of the same kind of I the same kind of idea like you notice up there there's like a uh, a gridded pattern on that either photograph or painting or whatever and then uh, they use the same gridded pattern on the inside of this uh, cut in half globe to create a fisheye warp on um, uh, on the interior of this of this concave globe and the same thing can be achieved in reverse this is. It looks like it's a photo manipulation to create that, but, but yeah, I mean, it's the same kind of thing. Creating, of like, um, using, playing with these principles to create interesting images, and like this kind of thing right here, this arts and crafts project right here is actually an, an artist exercise for under, understanding fish, fish eye. And this book, I'm interested in this book. I actually haven't seen, I actually haven't read Perspective in Action. Uh, but it apparently has a lot of, like, fun exercises you can use to, um, to play with and understand perspective with, with these little kind of arts and crafts objects that might help you wrap your head around how to do it. Like, he, he's like, like a cutout project where you create, create this kind of tesseract thing. Um, but yeah, fish islands. I really do want to practice it more because, like, uh, Kim Jong Gi, when he's a field sketching, you'll see him use uh, freehand fisheye warping a lot. Um, he got that way mainly. He got that way from observation sketching originally, so he has an intuitive uh, observation observational knowledge of how to play with that. But um, 
he also eventually did under, did study the rules of perspective, and it did help him, so he does understand it. And so do his acolytes. Well, this work I want to find examples of, because their work is, is amazing too, but also less intimidating because they're being, because it's more playful, and it is stuff that like feels more like stuff that any anyone here could do a little bit easier than like someone like Kim Chung Ki, who's just a machine. I'm thinking in the future of maybe like for the sketchbook club starting to make assignments of you gotta you gotta sketch at least one fisheye lens indoor point of view thing per week or something like that I don't know for that kind of thing to like kind of move people in the direction of, of doing those uh, observational sketchbook exercises like I don't know here's um, here's my quickie five point perspective freehand scrub like scribbly grid it's not even accurate but it's enough for me to play with so I kind of get a sense of this so knowing what I know about cylinders and cubes I can kind of do this and I create this kind of cube and cylinder mannequin here These are going to be following to this vanishing point at the center here. These are actually going to be warping this way. Maybe I might push that out a little bit more here. And the big thing you should be getting away from, you should be taking away from this mostly is just to just, just play with it. Um, you can, when you're sketching and freehanding in perspective, as long as you understand the basic rules, you can play with it freely, kind of rough out ideas and stuff. And like the, ac if you're going to be like use this to kind of work out a composition, the actual accurate stuff can be worked out later. This is pretty wild. I love, I do love it in anime when you'll occasionally see animation done on fisheye. I think Satoshi Kon's got some cool shots in some of his films that kind of go that direction, that kind of use that stuff. It was actually, it was actually more fun than I thought it was going to be. What I'm doing right now. I think I want to watch, like, um, for me personally, like, for wrapping my head around getting the figure in perspective, I think I want to watch some figure drawing demonstrations, seeing how artists kind of intuitively work through the figure a little bit more, because I'm kind of, like, relying on these QB boxman things, when I've seen, like, people who have a more intuitive knowledge of the figure sort of you build the perspective lines into the anatomy and stuff but of course like because everything's all warped my, like my sense of proportion is getting thrown off and stuff but this is surprisingly fun I didn't expect to be doing this and getting something out of this Sometimes it's, it's sometimes it's good just to go for it, like just to cut through the bullshit and try something. Even if it's like rough and loose and kind of a quick scuffed sort of thing like this. I'm gonna maybe put like kind of a UFO sort of thing up here, maybe. I guess this is a thumbnail for like some alien invaders walking through the town. Maybe put some warped buildings over here.
I think I want to play with with this style of pers like this style of perspective is completely bonkers, but it's fun. I mean, this feels fun, doesn't it? Like, I'm not kind of getting locked up doing this. Like, it's fun to make stuff bulge and warp and distort like this. So, yeah, I'd recommend people trying what I'm doing right now. This is actually really, I'm, I'm enjoying this. It looks like it's very useful to practice for, like, understanding 3D form. Yeah, not just that, but just, like, playing with perspective in general. Like, it's all there. Like, this is, there's three point, you know, there's three point from multiple angles. You could basically, you could maybe even, like, field guide parts of this. Like, little vignettes here and there. It's gonna be like the bendy warping stuff going on there, but um, but yeah, <laughs> it's, it's this fun shit. So yeah, I recommend doing literally what I just did now. That was really fun. So maybe let's look at some Steve on stuff like we've been meaning to that we that I keep putting off. Uh, I'm gonna bring him on this his video on the screen. Oh, hello. Alright, so... It's called Blossom Detective Homes. Uh, here's There's an actual channel to it, which I'm for some reason not subscribed to. Um, and it's... Uh, it's a successful Kickstarter. Oh, he's got the storyboards. Let's take a look at the storyboards. And also take we'll take a look at the whole film too. Um, yeah, like uh, he's really proud of his command of perspective, and you can even see a little bit of that going on in this illustration he did here. All right, here we go. You'll also see some of the tools that he uses to shorthand uh, drawing issues. Like, you can see some kind of, like, almost kind of copy-pasting, I think, going on in this little texture pattern here a little bit, I think. He flipped it on both sides so he doesn't have to draw the same thing over and over again. So, let's take a look at what's going on here. There's some ellipses. There's a bunch of ellipses in here that are going in perspective. Uh, I think I should cover the ellipses in perspective in a little bit, but um, just kind of... Uh, Timepiece looking thing. I have to see the. F I have to rewatch the film. I forget what the story is, but, um, but yeah. I mean, you can see from this. Uh, this is a two point perspective looking downwards, right here. The vanish first vanishing point is below us. Uh, when one of the vanishing points is below us, the horizon line is um, further up top because we're looking down at this thing. Um, there's the bottom vanishing point that these lines, that the lines on, the lines uh, are, that go, are going down are converging towards, and then there is a second vanishing point that is going backwards and up, and if we plot these lines, it's somewhere up here, so the horizon line would be somewhere up here-ish, like just off, just slightly off frame. So that means our eye level, where the camera is placed, is like about here. Up top, this like slightly above the black bar, in uh, in this shot, and uh, that leads into this, which um, the camera angle is is pretty much like the POV of the person who's looking down at this thing. Although it does kind of feel like this person is looming behind us, from how the shadow is. Like we're we're there, and this menacing person is is looming up behind us. And that would be a close-up of the character. This is a... I want to say this is a one-point perspective shot because I'm not seeing any warping going... I'm not seeing any angle convergence necessarily going on on this. That's terribly significant. It looks like they f he flipped both sides of the image here to save time. Uh, just to get like the sense of the room that they're in. Stuff like the background will be worked out later, but this is uh, generally like the overall composition and the camera angle being shown to us. We are looking up at this character a little bit. 
just kind of looking down at us uh, or from the point of view a little bit of the object that he's looking at but not exactly and we can see that there's a one point perspective convergence going on here Somebody mentioned that I had somebody I think was talking about um, five point perspective uh, about how a lot of Instagram artists like doing it. That is because uh, five point perspective is a is it's visually attractive. It's inherently visually attractive. It's also a flex for the artist's skill, the artist's skill, and. Uh, it looked kind of like a piece of jewelry, kind of. It's like a, those those five point perspective things have like this kind of diorama look to them. That's really fun, don't they? I mean, that's that's what I was getting even from doing like my quick little example. What's in here somewhere? Here we go. In my quick little example, like it's fun to kind of just like play stuff in here, like it's like a virtual terrarium, kind of. I definitely want to play with this more because this seems like a really fun way to just kind of mess with ideas and composition. Just just kind of play with stuff. So anyway, we get this really, really flat composition. Um, then the perspective kicks in. I think there's a little bit in here. So we'll try to maybe see if we can catch some of it. So arguably, if there's any kind of perspective being used in this, it might be on this, the, the, the way that this bullet is traveling here. But not really. There's not really any, any indication of perspective here. The closest thing we're getting right here is like on these flashes of silhouette inside the room. It's using more kind of a flat parallax effect, almost, where we can kind of like feel that these images back there are, are being projected into the back wall of the room or against the window pane. So now we get this huge composition here. Character coming out the window there. He is following the rules of perspective mm -hmm. too, and so is this building. That building was very close to us. And it's, and it's kind of off kilter from the rest of the composition, but that doesn't matter for the purpose of this. I'd be interested in seeing how this looks in the final film. Uh, but this background layout design right here is a nice illustration that has we can see a one point for some of these buildings. Mind you, like um, the vanishing point on these buildings here is going to change depending on the object. Like this right here, the vanishing point is going to be somewhere over there. Uh, this over here, the vanishing point for that is going to be somewhere over here, and so on. Uh, so that does kind of give a little bit of permission for this building here that's kind of flat to us to be at a different angle from the stuff in the rest of the city. So things are kind of at a regular angle and they're kind of curving this way too, like it's kind of curving over towards that building that's flat to us. But again, I'd like to see how this looks in the final film because there might be more perspective on that building, that really flat building. But I do like the idea of being, the idea being used here, like this really, really flat composition that leads over into a wide perspective shot like that. That's really cool. Somebody said that city is Prague style, probably. Or uh, it's I, it's a mix of like some several different European influences for sure. This is a fantasy world that this is taking place in. I'm not strictly. I don't. I think this is a fantasy world this is taking place in. Not strictly. Um, Real world, real world Britain or whatever. So this guy is kind of following like the perspective in the horizon. The horizon line is about here, of course. Um, we can see it about here. So this guy, if we were to put a cube on him, there's a perspective. There we can kind of see. You know, like you can see the um, his shoulders in are pretty close to the angle you get towards 
perspective line there and his butt, the bottom of his butt, going up to the perspective line from there. Can you see my mouse on screen, by the way? Yeah, good. Um, so, and then of course, this isn't a perfect drawing. This is a rough, loose storyboard drawing. And this is the kind of drawings we want to make when we're, uh, when we're storyboarding like this. So this is a very rough and loose, oops, this is a very, very rough and loose um, perspective camera move going on here with a character in perspective. So you cut to an undershot of this with a building that he just jumped out, with a building window he just jumped out of, a different camera angle. We see a, we see a perspective line on this. On here, you can see he drew through the building a little bit when he's working out the perspective. He darkened one side so he'd know what side is what. This guy is following the perspective lines too of the scene. Like the knees, knees are kind of parallel, but they're following the perspective line. The feet are parallel, but they're following the perspective line. So he didn't overcomplicate things with this pose for himself. It's a very, very parallel pose, except maybe the arms are at slightly different positions. So that you can you can kind of know where stuff is lining up in the perspective grid. Smear there. Character rolling into frame. Now things get a little bit trickier with the different with the legs moving at different rate with the legs in different positions. Legs and arms in different positions. But he's kind of rolling and you can kind of use the cube of his shoulders here for like this new angle down here and the other angle of the um, vanishing point going back there. And of course the vanishing point is now way up there from how the camera has swerved, uh, the, the camera's field of view has swerved down around here. So the way, like this, the way that this is framed almost looks kind of like a, um, I want to say a two point, edging, edging towards a one point, because this is almost like flat. So this is like telephoto lens-ish, kind of. All right, so in this one, he's actually using a um, animated 3D backdrop here as a shorthand, where you use like some photos of the front of flat texture of buildings and a uh, flat texture of um, bricks on the ground here. And that's, uh, and because of all the bricks all going back in perspective, that makes it easier to read the perspective that's going on here. This character is just full frame. So this is like, that was like a one point perspective shot. So now in this point, we're getting more of a two point perspective going on here with a vanishing point way over to the left. And then another one that is somewhere over on like the midpoint of the frame I want to say here with these two characters or the uh, midpoint of the um, second half of the frame like right about here ish we're kind of looking up at them a bit so our eye level, our eye level with the camera is about here I think let's try to maybe see where that is. Like, where does it get a little... Let's see where the camera is. Oh, the camera is like about here, actually. And looking up. Which sort of kind of emphasizes the energy and the dynamic the dynamics of what's going on, how crazy this is. Like, these characters are like really stressing running. Uh, the physicality of running going on right now. Here we go. Uh, this is a tribute to Hayao Miyazaki and Lupin the Third stuff right here, what they're doing there, leaking over those bushes. Yeah, this this looks very much like a composition from The Third Man. That is a film that I might bring up for us to watch in the future because that is a film noir classic that has amazing perspective compositions in it. Uh, it's one of my favorite films of all time. Uh, but here, let's take a peek at them. A peek at it real quick. Look at that. Look at that one point perspective with Orson Welles there. This iconic moment in, this moment in the film. Um, 
so now this is one point perspective actually almost two point kind of like there's kind of that going on there too that's very two point perspective there's a few scenes like this that that's that this scene is kind of homaging like the shadows on the wall sort of thing that the third man does really well especially this shot that Dutch tilt the horizon is skewed like that there's this kind of it, it, this was kind of two point perspective but you can argue that it's third that it's three point because there's kind of this angling going up there if you really look for it I guess yeah I think so a little bit Look at that that's definitely three point with the Dutch tilt going up there Yeah, The Third Man is an excellent film to look at if you want to see examples of how to play with perspective. This might actually, th these might actually be great to break down and study. Yeah, that stairwell, stairs, stairs is one of the most irritating things to draw, especially uh, in perspective, especially um, uh, spiral staircases. But you got to do them upshot there that is from the so that is from the point of view of the character we just saw and this is from the point of view of the character we just of the other character we just saw I don't think this one is the full is the third man this is notorious mm -hmm. uh, Cary Grant's notorious has big old Dutch tilt going on there. Famous Ferris wheel in the Third Man. Uh, literally, this film actually uses perspective principles of perspective for its storytelling. Uh, Orson Welles's character kicks, takes this character up in a Ferris wheel to show them how perspective changes. Literally, perspective when they uh, are up in one of these little cable, these are one of these little uh, Ferris wheel cars high above the city, and everyone looks like little ants down below. That's part of the storytelling. He actually like spells it out for him in that scene. But yeah, I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend Third Man for perspective study. Look at that. You can see that is a crane shot camera, a, a, high, a camera that's high above here that's look, that's tilted downward, looking down. So we get a two point, a actually a one point perspective kind of going on here looking down or no, no a two point down tilt perspective but anyway yeah the third man look that up and do, do studies from it I'm gonna do studies from it are you you might do some later on here um, but yeah this is a this looks very much like the best some of the shots we were seeing in the third man even like the using lighting in your storyboarding with perspective is a big thing and use that to, you can use that to create depth. That's definitely what's going on here. Look at that. That little kind of like bridge between the uh, little bridge between the buildings there. That's shadowing things. This character. Also, I just noticed this little character up here. That's against the building. That is one. That is definitely two point perspective right here. I think. Or no, that's one point. This is one point perspective. Because that's the focal point here. And these are kind of going straight. And then that's going straight. So that this is one point, I believe. But there's stuff in the background here that is using diff that's using a cur that's like there's another vanishing point for this object that's about here. Uh, and another one for this one that's going about here. Cool about these close-up shots is you don't have to worry about perspective as much, but uh, that's not true. This close-up of this mouse right here that still has uh, this is still sketchy and stuff. This still has a sense of a tooth cylinder right here, and uh, the dimensionality of the face still it's still using some rules of perspective here. So even when you get an extreme close-up like this on a character, you still got to think about 
how the face is constructed from perspective, even when you're doing like a roughly storyboard like this. Just using a photograph that's kind of a skewed here so that it creates these perspective lines for you from the roof tiles right here. And it's kind of at a Dutch tilt-ish angle, but I think it's supposed to, I think it's supposed to be implied that that's just the downward angle of the roof as opposed to the camera angle. It rolls down on the side of this roof here with a all right let's see what let's pull back here and see what perspective this has um so we see those going to that vanishing point we see those going to that vanishing point uh it's hard for me to tell if there, this is three point but it definitely looks like two point um You can kind of argue there's some three-point going on in there. But it looks more two-point than three-point to me. Um, and here's a, here's a moving camera CG shot. <laughs> Alright, this one vanishing point going there. Those are parallel lines, kind of. So this looks like it might be a one-point perspective. Or it could be two-point because of how these characters are right here. No, those lines are parallel there. So I would say that this is probably one point. No. I'm gonna I'm gonna say that this looks more parallel than it should be, and this is actually a two-point shot. So we got this upshot. He actually used to save time on this really annoying stuff to to draw in. Otherwise, he uh, used an upshot of some CG here, like some SketchUp drawn, some SketchUp models or something. I think. And then drew this these uh, chaotic boards falling towards the camera here, and you can see. Of course, he's using a 3D program. It's basically like it, it's full perspective, of, but uh, in terms of using this as a reference for drawing, we see these converging on one vanishing point here. Um, I think this is this could probably be one point. There's a, it's a very centered composition too. So we see from this, um, this, see the pr two point perspective grid in the backdrop here. Uh, it's hard to, for me to tell if these two characters are going at two different angles here. So this looks like it might be a down tilt two point, but based kind of on how they're angled on like the Z axis or whatever, this might be three point. So we get some more 3D shots. Yeah, I think, yeah, definitely. This is, yeah, this, yeah, because stuff is going towards us like that and chain and like really warping and so on. This is a three point. It becomes way more apparent when this happens. Huh. CG shot to work out the perspective more here. Anyway, yeah, uh, I'm going to take a little break here, and then we'll kind of do a quick review of what we went over, and I'll give people some tools to uh, I'll give people some uh, homework and uh, f to mess with the tools that we're going to that uh, we're going to be messing with throughout the week and connecting up with the other stuff and the other classes that I'm doing. Audio, the Blossom Detective Holmes first episode. If it's somewhere here, hmm. Well, maybe let's play the whole storyboard. All right, let's go for a quick restroom break, and then I'll be back.
Okay, so let's do a quick review here of what we went over today. And uh, the replay will be up a lot sooner than later. So, first thing we did, we went over these two principles. Everything that you do in storyboarding using perspective is going to be driven by these two principles. Anything that goes far farther way appears smaller and more compressed, and anything that is directly parallel to the viewer will not appear to compress. Uh, that means you have to keep in mind the eye level of things, and how you can see the sides or the tops of things depending on the horizon eye level, or of course how close it is to maybe to the vertical line. Um, the horizon line is what you use to determine whether stuff is above or below the viewpoint of your, cam uh, of your camera, or your point of view. One point perspective is useful for creating a singular focal point in a composition for a scene. Um, two point perspective is can handle most kinds of layouts, and uh, you can do up tilts and down tilts with it, like so. And even even stuff more like this, it's more an even composition. Two point camera tilts can also have perspective lines that are on a vertical axis like this with horizontal lines. Uh, so you get something like that going. Three point camera tilts uh, are basically like that, but turned it an angle. The objects are like turned at an angle, so you get like this kind of thing like that, this kind of thing going on. Um, in addition to that, there was a four point demonstration I gave over the top of this that shows for like if you are creating like this kind of warping going on here. That's actually that is actually technically supposed to be five point perspective. Uh, but we'll go over that in a second. So field of view, uh, wide angle, uh, wide angle is um, you. Uh, it's more dynamic. You get more visual information. It can also a sense can also create a sense of disorientation because stuff kind of warps. There's more visual information. Wide angle, you see you see more of like the vanishing point information. Uh, narrow field of view. Uh, there's less visual information, but it flattens out the scene and creates a calmer composition. Uh, telephoto, much, 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 much narrower field of view, where it almost kind of flattens the uh, composition, where it flattens the perspective in it. 
So I did a little camera move demo here where it kind of showed how you can plot a camera move on top of a perspective grid and figure out how stuff changes um, in perspective. Like this moving on, this, our actor in this scene is this cube, it's kind of moving through, coming to a rest here before we do a zoom in here at the end. Um, it's an empty folder. Feels bad. And then as a bonus, we went over this, which is five point perspective, which creates this kind of warped globe. Uh, this seems like something that'd be really fun as a toy to play with to help you wrap your so just play with perspective and wrap your head around how things change in perspective or for creating cool Instagram posts so um, homework this week it's mainly going to be three things with an optional bonus thing um, first homework the rules of perspective one point two point three point optional five point practice Actually, no, that's not really the homework. That is um, the general guideline of what you're going to do. The actual homework assignments is what you are going to do to practice those things. So first one is uh, practice from scenes in Films, animation, or live action, and try to figure out where the perspective grid is. The first one. Uh, that'll be one to three pages, but you can do. You can always do more than that. Second homework is. I just keep doing that. Practice perspective from figure drawing. Draw a box or, and try to fit the figure inside it, modifying the pose as you go. Three. And this one, uh, I'm gonna say again, one to three pages, but, um, oops. You can do this like even during our, our evening figure drawing workshops throughout the week too, or daytime. I actually didn't do any figure drawing workshops in the evening this last week because I really needed some me time to sort stuff out, but I'm planning on doing like probably around two of them this next week. So I'll get time to practice that then. Um, three. Practice okay. observation drawing from your POV on objects 
or the space around you. One to three pages. And that's your homework this week, folks. We'll be practicing and drilling perspective. And uh, I'll add one more optional thing. say play with it and have fun Ooh. it's not very well formatted is it there you go that is the homework so I'm gonna actually call this uh, class week two when I rename the YouTubes on the currently like the week or the weeks are kind of named strangely we are going to have a week zero which was the first week where I kind of introduced people to storyboarding but to keep things kind of like in line with the other classes I'm teaching this session that we're in will now be named known as week two when it's uploaded later on um, on YouTube uh, so yeah thank you all for coming uh, I hope got a lot out of this and I hope you have a lot to do this week. Uh, again, I'm uh, again I'd be happy to accept tips either in the form of Twitch Prime, Bits. Well, I actually have to thank Numa T T V for giving them giving me their Twitch Prime sub. Thank you very much, Numa. Every little bit counts. And I also have a Kofi link and a PayPal direct donation link for uh, accepting tips. It'll help me um, get art equipment I need to make these sessions smoother and uh, study materials I need to brush up on stuff so I can convey stuff better for y'all. Uh, but yeah, thank you all for coming. Those of you who stuck around, you get to see the congratulations screen. Congratulations! 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 Uh, thank you all.